During the last 25 years, the world has become aware of environmental problems its development is causing. Significantly, some of the problems are now affecting the entire Earth. Some problems include air pollution from energy production, transportation, the consumption of natural resources, and the production of waste is reducing air quality in many areas and causing acid rain, global warming, and ozone depletion. Governments began to recognize that the levels of environmental degradation that the current practices of economic development could not be sustained without significant impacts upon further generations. Thus, the idea of sustainability was born. Sustainability is commonly defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. This is a loose definition where technology is the crutch for the current society. Take plastics, for example. They are disposable, recyclable, and cheap. But what we fail to see are the negative impacts of manufacturing and producing the plastics that are designed to save our future. In this current environmental crisis, we must decide if plastics are really the solution or just a small carrot that makes us, as a society, feel better about our non-sustainable ways. In the words of Lear Keith, do we want to feel better or do we want to be effective? Are we sentimentalists or are we warriors? In Derek Jensen's novel, What We Leave Behind, he states, for an action to be sustainable, you must be able to perform it indefinitely. This means that the action must either help or at least not materially harm the land base. Is sustainability possible with plastics? In order to make plastics, we must extract raw materials from the earth, and what we don't recycle, we dump into the oceans and bury in landfills. In the U.S. alone, 2 million plastic beverage bottles are used every 5 minutes. Is that sustainable? We are on a production treadmill, and unless we hop off for more sustainable practices, we will end up being dragged along into devastation. Plastic is almost everywhere. Jensen couldn't have said it better when he wrote, by everywhere, I mean in huge portions of consumer products, in food and, and in packaging, in liquid containers and the liquids they contain. By everywhere, I mean in the oceans, in the air and on the land. By everywhere, I mean in Mount Everest and in the Meridian Trench and in remote forests. By everywhere, I mean inside every mother's breast milk, inside polar bear fat, inside every fish, inside every monkey, inside every songbird, inside every frog. And rest assured, it is inside you too. Jensen continues by saying that millions of these chemicals are used in products from varnishes to cosmetics to the coating of time-release pharmaceuticals to packaged food leach readily enough for those products so that they, by now, are in our blood, urine, saliva, seminal fluid, breast milk, and amniotic fluids. So what do we do? Ideally, we would say, stop using plastics. If they are everywhere and harming the environment, then we should resort back to our natural and organic beginnings. And if it isn't possible, we should simply do as Lisa Brown says and recycle more. The reality of the matter is this is a complex issue to tackle. It is almost unfathomable to comprehend how dependent we are on plastics. It's the keys of our keyboards, the shells of our blackberries and cars, the packaging of our medical supplies, and the siding of our homes. Realistically, we can't simply abandon everything that's plastic. It's the infrastructure of our economy, of our industries, and of our society. It won't be allowed. The fact is, plastic is just too cheap and disposable to be replaced with other more natural materials. Despite the fact that making these plastics are harmful to both the environment and the human race, we continue to support these products. So where's the middle ground? Do we really abandon all forms of plastic, or are we even really sure that plastics are detrimental to us? As it happens, in 1972, the Manufacturing Chemist Association had in place an industry-wide secrecy agreement concerning the cancer-causing properties of plastics. According to this agreement, the members of the task group were the ones entitled to receive information about the European project. In turn, they were told they should feel honor-bound to make sure such information remains within their companies unless and until formal permission has been granted for its release. With companies keeping secrets such as these, it's no wonder that we haven't taken action yet. We couldn't continue to purchase plastics such as PVC knowing that they caused cancer, right? PVC is the most popular type of plastic produced. It's used for consumer articles such as credit cards, garden furniture, and toys. It's also used in the office for folders, binders, furniture, and pens. The car industry uses PVC, especially as under seal, and it can be found in hospitals for medical disposables and as cable and wire insulation. PVC is one of the world's largest dioxin producers. 
This group of chemicals is some of the most toxic chemicals ever released into the environment. Dioxins are created when PVC is produced, recycled, and disposed of in incinerators, and when PVC products burn in accidental fires. Additionally, dioxins can be created during some industrial processes such as paper pulp bleaching and herbicide manufacturing. The highest environmental concentrations of dioxin are usually found in soil and sediment, with much lower levels found in air and water. Humans are primarily exposed to dioxins by eating food contaminated by these chemicals. Dioxin accumulates in fatty tissues where they may persist for months or even years. People who have been exposed to high levels of dioxin have developed chloracne, a skin disease marked by several acne-like pimples. Studies have shown that chemical workers who are exposed to high levels of dioxin have an increased risk of cancer. Other studies of highly exposed populations show that dioxins can cause reproductive and developmental problems and an increasing risk of heart disease and diabetes. More research is needed to determine long-term effects and low-level dioxin exposures on cancer risk, immune function, and reproductive development. But nonetheless, it is clear that plastics are yet again harming the human race and we are yet again refusing to do anything to change it. With all the harm regarding plastics, we need to determine what our tipping point is. At what point do we decide enough is enough? Is it when our unborn children are being poisoned in the womb, or is it when we create islands of waste and plastics in the ocean? Apparently neither, since both scenarios are common in our current society. Maybe we have gotten to this point because this transition has been a slow one. Maybe we haven't been aware that we are surrounding ourselves in plastic with no room to escape. But the time has come for a paradigm shift. Instead of futuristic plastics, we must resort back to bio-based materials. For virtually all PVC applications, safer alternatives exist. We should use more sustainable and traditional materials, such as paper, wood, or local materials. Biodegradable plastics for renewable sources are seen as a promising alternative for plastic products which have a short life cycle or are impractical to recycle, such as food packaging, agricultural plastics, and other disposables. Bio-based plastics can be made out of products obtained from raw materials produced by a natural living system or a growing system, such as starch and cellulose. The advantage of bio-based plastics is that they are readily able to degrade and can be composted. The only major drawback with these products is that they are not mass-produced such as PVC and other plastics and are consequently more expensive. However, the real alternative to plastic is fundamental change. Plastics are made from crude oil and natural gas and are thus interconnected with our dependency on oil. An effective approach to fighting plastics means reducing petroleum consumption across the board. We need to do so anyway as the world peak in global oil extraction is coming closer and closer to its apex. Natural gas is getting tighter in supply as well. Maximum energy conservation of non-renewable sources is essential. The choice is ours. So for starters, our reusable shopping bags are going to get more use. Open our minds to a new way of living will make it easier to free ourselves from the twin unfounded assumptions that we will always need and have plastics and that they can be safe enough. So in the age of sustainability, with all that we know about plastics, will we change our actions? It is no longer a question of can we change, because all of these alternative options are viable and we can change, but will we? Will we make the conscious effort to buy more natural-based products or even products that are not harmful to the environment during any part of their manufacturing process? The change will not be an easy one, but it is a necessary one. Again, in the words of Lear Keith, do we want to feel better or do we want to be effective? Are we sentimentalists or are we warriors? We must become warriors because we no longer have the luxury of being sentimental. This is our time. We must act now.